Yes, definitely going to make it. We're going to have this. This area is going to be cleared within a matter of a couple of hours, and it's going to be all displayed in all the cabinets. I think we're getting there. This uh, once I've got this piece, these pieces up in this main display up here. That's going to be the main exhibits of this part of the museum. I didn't think it was going to get this far. It was touch and go, but uh, we're getting there. It's, it's something I've always dreamt of having and doing, and it's now here in reality. So it's it's here. In 1940-42, the pretty agricultural Devonshire village of Dunkerswell might hardly have known there was a war on. Yet, by October of 1943, there was to be 5,000 temporary residents living in the village, whose population previously was scarcely into three figures. Sleepy little Dunkerswell had become a unique and strategic weapons base against the threat of Hitler. The atmosphere of the airfield 50 years later seems to tug at the heartstrings of us all to try and understand what happened here. Appealing, in particular, to an 11-year-old boy whose curiosity has enabled us to remember and discover those who served here so very long ago. December the 7th, and the U-boats swarm to American waters. Their number has soared to 300. For the U-boats, it is a period of triumph. Then, the crisis, 400 U-boats. And during the first 10 days of March 1943, they sink over 600,000 tons of Allied shipping, most of it in a region beyond reach of long-range aircraft. Even now, with factories and yards under repeated attack, it is estimated that U-boats are being produced at the rate of about 24 per month, and that there are at present some 450 of them, of which about 250 are likely to be operational at one time. I was only a child when, uh, of course, when the war started, uh, my father took over the Royal Oak in 1937. Uh, my me first memories was when war broke out, one of the first things we had was a searchlight battery out on the Hemiop Road. Of course, loads of soldiers, uh, British soldiers, and we, we kids used to go outside the pub, because uh, I was brought up in the pub, uh, and watch the beams pick up the enemy aircraft, you know, in, in the beam of the searchlights. Well, that, that was my first recollection. Well, of course, then, uh, people used to come in the bar with maps and one thing and another, and the next thing we found out, they were planning an airfield up here, and they were doing plans and one thing and another in the pub. But it was a very haphazard way of doing it. Anyway, they went on with the building, in come the wimpy lorries and the mud and whatnot and the smell of diesel, but uh, it was all fun for us kids at the time, just a lot of noise. It was August the 6th when the first lot of Americans come in, I always remember it was my brother's birthday. Well, of course, us kids come out of school and, and these yanks was everywhere, you know, and uh, caused a lot of fun, but in September, uh, the main lot of Americans come in and then again when we come out of school the place was absolutely saturated with Americans they were everywhere jeeps lorries everywhere well then it was time to open up the pub well, of course mother didn't understand American money all she knew was a dollar was five shillings and my aunt she was behind the bar as well right confusion you see because father wasn't there he's an agricultural worker and he had to work every day but anyway they coped I mean they, I don't expect anybody had the right change but still for all yeah, they all got a drink. Um, I first came to Tungus in 1977 as a, a day out with my parents just uh, one of my dad's excursions. Over the years after that, I went out on my first little walkabout, which is normal Dunkerswell weather, it was raining, 
miserable, damp, dusky, horrible. And I'm walking down through the runway, and the first thing I found was the 0.5 live. So I went back to the clubhouse, and that was all how it started. Um, after that, I went to my see my mates, and he said, "Cool, it sounds a good idea. Let's let's go up and have a a day out up there to have a look around." So we went out, had a look around, and we found a bit more pieces in, of Dunkswood's history. David, yep, look what I found. Well, what is it? I think it's a pump. Hmm. Our first excursion with Darren Lillywhite went out and was walking along a cinder track and we found an RAF button and I said to him, wonder what's around here other than this? And that's when we found a dump about 60 foot across by 40 foot across. And it was amazing what was in there. And after that, we met up with Rupert Fairclough and we thought, right, let's go back and dig as much as we can, every weekend we can. And that's how we started off actually finding all the bits, digging up the bits, and trying to sort out what they come from. And beginning, we got it wrong. We said it was the fortresses, which was wrong. It turned out to be the Liberators with the US Navy. The T2 hangars at Dunkerswell are part of the handful of buildings still remaining today. A dance to celebrate the opening of the Memorial Museum is to be held in number two, where it may be the last opportunity to witness a reenactment of a World War II hangar dance. We are having the grand opening tomorrow on the 5th of July, and we thought it would be very appropriate since uh, John Miller is our honorary patron to bring his 18-piece orchestra down here on the 4th of July, American Independence Day, and give us a great Glen Miller style dance, the type of dance they used to have in the hangars in the 1940s. They just cleared the aircraft out as here and um, had a hangar dance. We got 20 veterans coming over for the dance from America. Um, they, of course, were, were fellows that served here during the war. And the average age would be 75 to, I think the oldest one is 92, 93. Very nostalgic trip for them because, for, of course, for many of them, it will be the last time they'll come here to their old uh, station. Who, which was nicknamed Mudsville Heights uh, because when they came here they were, they were ankle deep in mud, the, the airfield having just been constructed. We're lucky enough today to be able to be sitting in a, an original World War II hangar which perhaps isn't going to be here for many more years. Mm -hmm. So it's preserving the history of Dunk as well as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the airfield, you can see there's been a lot of development on the airfield. Um, bits are being bought, bits are being sold for private use and slowly the airfield is gradually getting smaller and smaller, although there are still some flying clubs operating from here, and we're lucky enough to have the Second World War control tower still standing, but uh, these things aren't going to last forever. So at the end of the day, we still the museum will be preserving the, the history of the airfield. Flying the Liberator, for one, it was noisy. We had to have uh, phones, earphones. If you wanted to uh, a converse, conversation with somebody, it was uh, 
not too pleasant a flight all the time. I was scared a lot of times. A few times uh, we were, we, we didn't make it almost one time that we, the tower lost contact with us and thought we had crashed. But luckily we, uh, we got off okay and uh, went on with our mission. I remember this uh, warm uh, beer when I was over here in 1943. I didn't like it at first, but it was the only thing we had. So we had to, uh, to drink it. So the more I drank it, the better I, I liked it. it. It was very good, I thought. And to this day, back in the States, I am drinking room temperature beer because uh, I, I like it. And some of my friends think I'm a little cuckoo maybe or things of that nature. and 1,000 spam sandwiches. <laughs> Ernest Maxim, another producer at the BBC, saw us for another uh, television spectacular he was doing, put us in that. And then Leslie Grade saw us in that, that's Michael Grade's father, and uh, put us in two weeks in the singing bill at the London Palladium. So actually our first variety date together was the London Palladium. Because we always said we started at the top and worked our way down. <laughs> and we finished yeah. up in a hangar. <laughs> hanging on in a hangar, still hanging on. Uh, uh, yeah, that was 42 years ago. Yeah. 
We had a, an air show in 1984, which we put on our, our first little display, which was consisted of two tables. And we had public beginning to get an interest in what we found and giving us little tidbits of information about the airfield. And from there we went on for a talk at Miss School. I done a talk in my history lesson, which it went down fairly well, but they were in a bit sceptic of if we knew exactly what the bits were. Our first instinct, we had a little caravan with some shelves up, put them on the shelves and asked people if they wanted to come in, have a look what we've got. It wasn't very neat and tidy, but it was our first, we called it our museum. Then Rupert and Darren thought, right, let's get back into it. So they came back in and said, look, let's try to start a proper museum and get the people we know to be involved in it and established what is now Dunkers World Memorial Museum. David Sharlin is my son. Uh, they was walking across the airfield and they seen this image of a flying pilot coming towards them. He gradually walked slowly across with his mate. When he got to him, he went through him and he, when he come to go into his body, he holded his breath and when he turned around to see where he went, he wasn't there. Did you see that? I think so. I do believe myself this ghost was telling David Charlin to carry on with this museum because he th knew it, he had it in mind. So he told him to carry on and do it and he's been doing it ever since. And that's what we thought, wow, <laughs> you know, it's, um, what could that be? But then we think, well, we're teenagers, we knew what that was, that was a ghost. And from then on I thought, if we collect these things, show these things for the public, he's, his memory, his life is all rolled into one, actually put in the museum to be shown why he died. And that, I feel, is the basic reason why I wanted to get a museum up and running. Madam Mayor, members of the 7th Air Wing, and ladies and gentlemen, it's an extreme pleasure to be here uh, on behalf of uh, the Ambassador of the Court of St. James, the Honorable William Crow. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here, and he truly wishes he could be here today, but uh, there's other uh, engagements in London over our uh, 4th of July weekend, as you might understand. Don't mention the war. <laughs> and in closing, I'd like to thank the, uh, the people who made this happen, uh, the founding members, uh, the committee, and uh, everybody whose thoughts turned this into reality. Thank you. Remember them and not forget them, like, yeah, same sort of day. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's the fire I was involved in when I was here. What happened? Had a Wellington bomber catch on fire while I was defueling it. Is that potentially lethal, I think? Well, it put me in a hospital for almost 19 months. But uh, I'm okay now. Is that a British hospital? Uh, no, it was a base hospital here, then a Navy hospital, U.S. Navy hospital in Netley, and then back to the States. Oh, most of my job was to fly Catalinas.
beside all the other aircraft. I flew every aircraft for the third year. And uh, my job was either air sea rescue or any, uh, any job that they were given to me. That was part of my job, to spot submarines and then get the 24s, the B-24s to do the kill. That was my job. But uh, I was fortunate to have a Jeep of my own because I was the skipper pilot. And, uh, but also the people here, we became friends, like we used to give them uh, uh, cigarettes <laughs> or uh, I think we used to exchange eggs for butter. Hi there, Dorothy. Hello. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Good to see you again. Yes. Thought I'd uh, just drop in and uh, bring you in some butter. Hope you can find a use for that. I'll be very pleased with that. And I've got some eggs for you. That's very kind of you, ma'am. Anyway, I've got a dash and I'm kind of a hurry, so uh, I'll catch you again. Yes. Okay, you take care yeah. now. Bye. Bye, Bye now, Dorothy. Bye. Bye now. I, I feel that, that uh, the people up here are doing a tremendous service to those of us who served here because uh, they say they will never forget us and, and we can't get that kind of praise even in our own uh, country. I was a great friend of, of Joe Kennedy uh, and uh, made several trips to London with him and saw his sister up there, Kit. Well, he was uh, a fair man and uh, uh, perhaps uh, I didn't, didn't know the rest of the Kennedys, but he was a fine man in, in my book. I had to deal with him. He came over with a wine mess in the, in the first place and they were going to take profits from it. And I said, we're not going to do it that way. And he turned over all of the, the spirits and so forth uh, to the mess and let us uh, pay it off as, as we used it up, which I thought was a terrific gesture. I flew uh, a couple of missions with different pilots and I finally was assigned to a permanent crew with uh, uh, Jeffrey Marshall from Evanston, Illinois. And I flew with him on probably 20 missions. He finally had somewhat of a battle fatigue and he was sent back by the uh, surgeon, the flight surgeon. At that time, Kennedy had lost his crew. They had decided to go back because they had so many missions in. But he elected to ask Admiral Reedy, uh, not Admiral Reedy at that point, he was uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander Reedy, if he could stay on for another tour of duty. So he had no crew and we had no pilot, so we got together and uh, we started flying with him. We were crew 17 and we flew about nine missions with Joe uh, prior to the fact that he went on to a special mission. He was an excellent pilot. He would get us in trouble now and then with Admiral Reedy flying to places where we shouldn't have been, but he, he was really researching the submarines very closely. And we got into Guernsey Isle one time and we got pretty well whacked up. But, uh, but he was a really a, a super pilot and a, a very nice man. Joe Kennedy, he was up here as well. He used to come down the pub and buy his beer, which was a triple X, better, shilling a pint. Yeah, I remember he used to come in.